I want to start by thanking Curtis and Jill for organizing this and inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be here. And then BIOS for sponsoring this. Um, and today what I'd like to do is give you uh, a glimpse of one way to approach human microbiome studies, the way that we are approaching it in my lab. And yes, we really do call it nose picking for progress because I gave up dealing with all the jokes and decided to just go with it. <laughs> we also do snot for science and boogers for biomedicine. <laughs> Um, okay, and, and really it was my postdocs and not my kids who came up with those. <laughs> so what I'd like to do today is uh, give you an idea of how we are mining the nasal microbiome for new insights into human pathogens. I'm going to start out with a little introduction to your nose, then a conceptual background of how we approach this question in my lab, and then illustrate that, how that works in actual practice by taking you through one vignette that is very close to submission. But it's a really nice illustration of how we go from um, microbiome to interaction data. We study bacteria that live in the human nose. Let me introduce you to the inside of your nose. So don't do this, but everyone at the age of three has done this. If you take your finger <laughs> and you stick it in the opening of your nose, that opening is called your nostrils, or doctors like to call it your anterior nares. And what you touch is the skin surface of the human nasal vestibule. So this area of your nose is a skin surface, complete with sweat glands, sebaceous glands, those cute little hairs. And it's what you can see when you look in the mirror, if you go like this. About right here, the surface starts to transition. And as you go through the nasal cavity, you transition to a mucosal surface. And we're interested in bacteria that live on this surface and all the way back through to the back of the top of your throat, which is called the nasopharynx. And, we, th and we, we study bacteria that live commonly in both adults and children. And we think about these bacteria in terms of how they affect us as human. This is my clinical bias. I want to know what they do to us, good or bad. Today, at this present point in time, the majority of taxa that have been identified in the nasal microbiome are classified as commensals meaning we gain no net harm or benefit from their presence on our surfaces. However, I and others in the field think that if we actually understood their function in our microbiome, we'd be able to reclassify some of these as mutualists, meaning we gain benefit from their presence on us. And finally, the nose is home to a couple of species which I think are best called pathobionts. I grew up in med school calling these pathogens. But unlike many pathogens, say Vibrio cholera, which lives out there, these are pathogens that most of the time when they interact with the humans, they interact with us as commensal organisms. But on a bad day, they can put you in the ICU. So my interest in the nose was really driven by my clinical experience and the fact that two, two human pathobionts commonly colonize the nose. So on any given day, about a quarter of the U.S. population has Staph aureus happily living in the nostrils. And over 40% of children under the age of seven have streptococcus pneumoniae living throughout their nasal cavity. And so these are the two pathogens that we focus on in the lab. For these to colonize us, they of course have to interact with us, the host. This is the very important area of host pathogen interaction research. But in addition to interacting with our cells, they have to invade and then <clears throat> reside in a pre-existing microbial community that's made up of all these commensal bacteria we know a lot less about. So in my lab, we're asking what I think is a simple question, which is can any other members of the bacterial microbiota in the nose keep these pathobionts out or at least under control? Uh, there are a number of ways you can address this question, so I'm going to show you how we've chosen to do it. We start with information about the composition of the microbiome. Some we generate, most comes from other groups. And based on just that compositional information, we generate hypotheses about potential pairwise interactions between commensals and these pathobionts. And then we take a very reductionist approach to testing these hypotheses. And we develop conditions that allow us to do co-cultivation, looking for phenotypes such as this one, which is a classic example of antibiosis. By taking this reductionist approach, we've been able to start to do functional studies that allow us to define molecular mechanisms 
of commensal pathobiont interactions that can occur. These are examples of some of the kind of interactions we've seen. But of course, this is just the first step. This says they can occur in a Petri dish in the lab. Um, once we have a phenotype, in my lab we use a combination of bacterial genetics. All of the genera that we're interested in are readily cultivable, which is a, a thing that something I think we have to take advantage of. Uh, three of the five have decent genetic systems. So we use genetics, transcriptomics. We do a lot of um, co versus monoculture, RNA-seq. It works great. <laughs> Uh, and genomics, and the goal is to get at genes that are involved in this interaction. We also do what I would consider some very basic chemistry. We do very basic extraction mm -hmm. protocols um, that then allow us to collaborate with mass spectrometrists and natural products chemists to go after the compounds that are involved in interactions. By the way, this does not do this in case you know what this is. <laughs> we don't know what does this yet. <laughs> um, and, and again, our goal is to get into genes. Uh, in the long run, what we're going to do, and this is where, at some point, I'd love to have data like Jill showed you, but I don't. We have some limitations due to low biomass that we haven't gotten over yet, is to go to use metatranscriptomics, metagenomics, and mass spec from samples, again, directly from the natural environment to figure out what is their relationship between these genes or the compounds they produce and the composition of the microbial community. Right now, where we're at is <coughs> working to use QRT-PCR to detect genes that we know are involved in interactions in the natural environment of the host. And because it's easy to get a nostril swab or a nasal swab from a human being, we go directly back to the environment where these organisms live. Because we are the preferred or sometimes almost only host for some of the organisms we're interested in. And the long-term goal, of course, is to identify compounds that would be considered microbial drivers of community composition, because these have potential as therapeutic compounds in the future to allow us to sustainably manage the composition of the microbiome community, particularly people who are at high risk for infections with aureus or pneumococcus, and actually promote health. All right. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through an actual example of how we've used this framework. And this is our model and I'm going to show you the data on which this model is built. This is work spearheaded by Lindsay Bomar. She's a fantastic postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And the current model is that Carinibacterium species modify their habitat in a way that makes it inhospitable for Streptococcus pneumoniae. How many of you have worked with Streptococcus pneumoniae or feel like you know it well? All right, so I was right in the intro part. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Streptococcus pneumoniae. I'm going to call it pneumococcus. It's easier to say, and it's its historic nickname. So pneumococcus colonizes the human nose. It can be detected from the nostrils all the way back to the nasopharynx. Um, there are high rates of colonization in children between six months and seven years of age, and this is worldwide. And colonization is known to increase the risk of infection as well as transmission. When pneumococcus attacks, it causes septicemia, meningitis, pneumonia, all very bad things to have when you're little, and much more commonly, the middle ear infections of early childhood. It's one of the three most common causes of those middle ear infections. So all pneumococcus are not equal in terms of pathogenicity. There are 90 capsular serotypes. 13 serotypes account for the majority of invasive pneumococcal disease. I feel very fortunate to practice medicine in the time of the conjugate pneumococcal vaccine. The key thing about this vaccine is it works in little kids. It's immunogenic in little kids. And since introduction of the vaccine in about 2000, it has drastically reduced the rates of invasive pneumococcal disease, both in children and adults, proving those kids are really the reservoir of disease. <laughs> <laughs> but the vaccine's been much less successful at preventing milder, more common infections like middle ear infections of childhood. And it has made very little dent in the overall colonization rate because it's really targeted to those 13 invasive serotypes. So there's a real need from a public health point of view, to do a better job at managing pneumococcal colonization. One route is the search for the so-called universal pneumococcal vaccine, which is a very important area of study. But there are a handful of us who think about microbiome who've started to wonder if maybe the microbial community might influence someone's susceptibility to colonization. We don't know yet. But to ask this question, you start with very basically with something very simple, which is, is there a difference in the bacterial communities and the noses of kids who are free of pneumococcus versus those who were colonized with pneumococcus. And uh, to do this, several groups, including ours, have 
done bacterial community analysis, you swab kids' noses, what you really do is you piggyback onto a really nice existing epidemiologic study of colonization, take a few of their samples, um, and use 16S rRNA gene to identify the genus, the general in the community, and then you simply classify those communities based on whether they are negative or positive for pneumococcal colonization by culture, because you can't identify it by a single region of 16S by itself. Um, and then if you're us, we used a tool developed by Nicola and Curtis called Linear Discriminant Effect Size Analysis, Linear Discriminant Analysis Effect Size, LEFSA, <laughs> um, which allows us to ask if any taxa are overrepresented in communities based on this classification. And what we observed is for kids who are free of pneumococcus, that's the state on this side, there were the two genera, Carinibacterium and Delosa granula were overrepresented. Um, conveniently, if you study, or if you're asking about kids who are colonized with Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus is overrepresented in the kids with pneumococcal colonization. Uh, when we saw this data, it was very exciting to us because it beautifully corroborated data that had been published already from Melinda Pettigrew's lab using a different cohort of kids, a slightly different nasal sampling technique, and a different analysis approach. So status decisions in the room, you can cringe if you want, but I kind of feel like when I start to see the same result with different techniques, it maybe it's actually robust and worth me following up on, and less likely due to chance alone, I don't know. Any, no, no, okay. <laughs> so this allows you to generate a very simple hypothesis, that antagonism exists between Carinibacterium and pneumococcus. This is exactly the kind of simple hypothesis that we can test using a reductionist approach in the lab. We found out very quickly and not surprisingly that in the laboratory, pneumococcal produced peroxide really irritates Carinibacterium for a variety of reasons um, that I won't go into now. This is thought not to be physiologically re relevant in the host. So we get around, we can mitigate this effect um, simply by adding catalase to our medium as a supplement. And that allows us to ask this question in vitro. All right, so Carinibacterium. So members of this genus are common nasal and skin commensals. And we study non-diphtheriae. Most people have only heard of Carinibacterium diphtheriae, which is the cause of diphtheria. We study non-diphtheriae species. These are benign and relative to other human-associated organisms, pretty understudied. And their functions in the microbiome are largely unknown, though we have some ideas about their metabolic potential. So we had to pick one genus to start with to look for interactions. And we, one genus, one species, and we chose Carinibacterium acolens. We chose it because it's been detected in the human nose from the nostril all the way back to the nasopharynx, and because it's medically boring, really, really boring, <laughs> which is what we wanted. Ah. And like a number of Carinibacterium species, it requires lipid for its growth. So it lacks a fatty acid synthase, and therefore you have to supply fatty acids extracellularly or a source of them. And in the lab, most people use a synthetic lipid called tween 80. Now, of course, there's not tween 80 in any of our noses <laughs> or on any of our skin surfaces. So what's the natural source for these fatty acids? Well, we got a hint by looking at the structure of tween 80. All right, key points. On your left, this polyoxyethylene sorbitan moiety, the key point is it is hydrophilic. So you can mix it in aqueous medium and it works nicely. On the right is the part the bacteria really cares about. This is oleic acid, and they're joined here by an ester bond, which should be cleavable by an enzyme with esterase activity. And uh, when you think about this surface, the nostrils, what, lives, what is there that is comparable in structure to tween 80? Well, it turns out that humans, unlike uh, other mammals that have been uh, examined to date, that we actually produce a lot of triacylglycerols. So triacylglycerols constitute 40% of human sebum. <clears throat> and, our, and they're in our skin service lipids. Sebum is that stuff that comes out of your pores. You actually most of the time want it there because it's an important protectant on your skin to have that lipid layer. And this is the structure of triac uh, triacylglycerol. You have a glycerol backbone. You have these fatty acid moieties. Um, human triacylglycerols, the moieties, all have more than 12 carbons in them, and you have this ester. 
And what you would need to free up one of these fatty acids is an enzyme with lipase activity. So we chose triolein, which is commercially available, uh, to represent human skin surface triacylglycerols. We chose it first off because it has that ester of oleic acid reminiscent of tween 80. So we knew that oleic acid would serve as a good fatty acid source for the cardiobacterium acolins. Lindsay's been able to show that triolein supports the growth of uh, acolins. So what you see here on the y-axis, this is the uh, turbidity measured as optical d uh, density at 600. And you're seeing a late stage in a growth curve, so more growth here. This is the triolein with the, we have to solubilize it in a small amount of chloroform because it's very uh, hydrophobic. And this is the chloroform added as a control alone. So triolein supports the growth. So having found a lipid that m more mimics the natural environment, and then we use our medium which does not <laughs> mimic the natural environment, but we're moving in that direction, um, we set up a co-cultivation assay. We start with known amounts of pneumococcus and crinibacterium, and we spot five microliter spots onto medium. And we've got our catalase to mitigate the peroxide effects. We've got our lipid substrate, the acolins needs. And we give crinibacterium a two-day head start because it grows a lot slower. And then we inoculate the pneumococcus next to it. We wait overnight. And what we observe is that an established community of crinibacterium acolins produces something that diffuses out into the medium and inhibits pneumococcus. So if you're us, this is fantastic, because now in the medium is a diffusible anti-pneumococcal substance. And we can start to get at that by seeing if we can extract that anti-pneumococcal activity from the medium. Uh, and the way we do this is we grow wands of crinobacterium acolins on medium, but we don't grow them directly on the medium. We have medium, thin layer of triolein, and then we put down a 0.2 micron polycarbonate filter and then we put down our lawn of cells. And that allows us, after the crinibacterium has grown up, to just lift off of the cells, leaving behind medium that has been conditioned, what we call self-reconditioned medium, by the growth of acolins. So this medium is going to contain everything that acolins puts out into the environment. We can extract a subset of those molecules simply by dropping this into methanol. And now we have an extract of a subset of those molecules. And we can ask, does it contain the anti-pneumococcal activity? And then the control for this is going to be medium that has never seen the cells. So we're going to extract a medium alone control. And we, to test for anti-pneumococcal activity, we use a very traditional disdiffusion assay, which simply means you drop your, right, okay, you spot your extract on a disc and drop it on a freshly plated lawn of pneumococcus, and you see if the pneumococcus will grow up around the disc. And what we observed on your left is that the extract of the conditioned medium from acolins creates a zone of inhibition, so it contains the anti-pneumococcal activity, whereas the medium alone control extract, the cells grow right up to the disc. So this is great. This has the activity. This doesn't. Using this, we went to collaborate with a mass spectrometrist at Vanderbilt, Sean Davies. And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is a subtractive mass spec uh, trace. So what you're going to see are peaks that are of things that are either over, either enriched or unique to this extract. Um, so there were three main peaks that we observed. And if you focus in on this one with a mass to charge ratio of 281, this is oleic acid. So we wondered, what does oleic acid do to the growth of streptococcus pneumoniae? You take pure oleic acid, redo your disdiffusion assay now, and we see that pure oleic acid inhibits the growth of pneumococcus. It wasn't the really cool small molecule, but it is an interesting story. <laughs> um, so if you, so we look back in the literature, and, and this is, um, you should always look back in the literature. There's all sorts of really cool things in the literature. And it, oleic acid had been described previously as having antibacterial activity against another species of streptococcus, streptiogenes. So there was precedent for this. Um, and the next thing Lindsay did was think about what, free fatty, what fatty acids could be freed up from host surface triglycerides, which ones had been detected either in nasal fluid or on skin surface lipids, and of the ones that are commercially available, put together a panel of those and tested them in this assay. So what you're going to see on this slide, these are the free fatty acids we've tested. Anyone who's a fatty acid aficionado can pay attention to the middle. The rest of you skip over it. 
And this is the results in the disk diffusion assay. If you see a number here, there was inhibition. Um, we can't tell you yet why these don't inhibit. We have a few ideas. So we've got all these fatty acids that we derive from host triglycerides that inhibit pneumococcal growth. What gene encodes the lipase that acalin needs to release fatty acids from these skin surface triacylglycerol? Um, there wasn't anything annotated in the genome, but it wasn't that hard to find with some bioinformatics. But what I want to skip all of that and show, tell you that we have now identified the gene responsible for the secreted lipase activity. And to do this, we, whoops, we took advantage of the fact that growing on tween should only require esterase activity. So we made the mutants with tween 80 as the fatty acid source. Okay. Ah, so I'm going to show you the data now. This is, again, a, a later point in a growth curve. So this is your turbidity's representation of growth with medium plus triolian. This is the mutant. This is a tentative name. We're still trying to sort out the correct naming for this. Uh, and we get basically no growth of a mutant that contains an in-frame deletion of the candidate lipase gene, whereas wild type gives us nice growth. And the next key step is... If we add back this gene plus its promoter, will we restore growth on triolian? And the answer is yes. And actually, the control in this experiment also is that these both have the empty vector. So we know the vector doesn't have an impact. So we've now, shown, we've now identified the gene that's um, required for this lipase activity in Carinibacterium acolans. So at this point, we have enough data to put together our current working model which gives, which generates for us the next wave of testable hypotheses. So, uh, Crinibacterium aclans secretes a lipase into the environment. This lipase can hydrolyze ester bonds in host surface triacylglycerols, freeing up fatty acids, many of which have anti-pneumococcal activity. The implication of this is that at low relative abundance, Carinibacterium could be present when pneumococcus is there. But that at some level of abundance of acolins, you might have enough free fatty acid liberated in the environment that it would make it inhospitable for pneumococcus. Um, the other implication, of course, is that this model should be generalizable to other skin sites that where Carinibacterium species are numerically dominant and also impact other fatty acid susceptible bacteria, so other, particularly other species of Streptococcus. Um, and I have no idea how I am on time, Curtis. Okay. Um, so I can stop here or I can give you a hint of two other vignettes where we've used similar techniques. I think I'll actually stop and take questions about this. But first, I'm going to thank the people who've actually done the work. Um, these are members of my lab, past and present. I've listed a lot of our collaborators in particular for this work, Sean Davies at Vanderbilt. And uh, these are the, this is the, the two leads in the EPI group that kindly took swabs out of their freezer for us to use. And then the funding sources that have taken risks on projects in my lab. Had a, a yeah. quick question. So, the corny bacterium can use oleic acid as a carbon source, and ah. so I guess I'm just wondering how it makes the decision well, to use it as a carbon source or to release it into the environment as um, an antimicrobial. It, it doesn't necessarily it. have to use it. Okay. it, so it needs fatty acids. Corny bacterium are uh, phylogenetically so they have carinomycolic acids, mm -hmm. so they have this outside lipid coating like mycobacterium do. They're phylogenetically very closely related, and, and it's not clear looking at the literature whether they use this primarily as a carbon source or primarily to route into the production of carinomycolic acids. Um, and when you look at the phylogenetic tree, what's really interesting is if you look at the phylogenetic tree of carinobacterium, um, this lipid requirement is spotty throughout the tree, suggesting probably multiple loss events at different branches. Um, but do you have any idea? It seems that some of that material is needed for cell growth? The way we grow these bacteria, they have ample carbon sources okay. that they can use. So, but in, in the nose then? So, well, so <laughs> <laughs> in, in the nose, and this, 
conceptually, um, I don't necessarily think our surfaces are carbon limited uh -huh. because we uh, excrete glucose in our sweat. We excrete fatty acids. Um, you get a lot of cellular debris. Um, so, and, and this was a change in my thinking from talking to someone who's an environmental microbiologist where I was worried about like wasting energy producing some molecule in, a, in, in another, in the case of propionibacterium, that it didn't need in just excreting this waste product. And they're like, well, if carbon's not limited, who cares? Okay. So, uh, so Kareni can use sugars, they can use amino acids, they can um, use fatty acids, they can use a variety of carbon sources that are readily available on our surfaces. Okay, la last question, I yeah. promise. So do you know anything about the regulation of lipase <sighs> activity? We do not. Um, we don't yet. We don't. We're in the process of doing some experiments that might give us a hint of whether it's constitutive or not. I, I wouldn't be surprised in this organism that's lipid requiring it's, it's constitutive. I would not assume that in the l organisms that don't require exogenous lipid, if it is regulated. And that's something for future work. That's part of AIM-2. <laughs> All right. Um, so have you looked for the gene, have, have you done shotgun med genomics for the nasal sites? And if so, have you looked for this lipase gene to see if it's um, present, obviously, and then also if, it's, uh, if there's different variants of it that might suggest there's other species doing the activity? Um, so the second question is easier to answer in that we've looked for lipase homologs in other crinibacterium that by culture, species that by culture have been isolated at some point in time from the nose. And um, both ones that are lipid requiring and lipid independent ha encode for lipases, some of them putatively secreted. Um, they're not always exact same lipase family member, but that's okay. They probably have the same function. I don't remember if we pulled down the HMP data. Now that we know, like, <laughs> it's relatively recent that we're absolutely sure what the gene is. Now that we know what the gene is, we haven't gone back and looked, because there is metagenome data for the adult nostrils in, and I've never seen pediatric metagenome data yet. Um, but there's data for adults, and we could go back and look for this gene in adult, in the adult metagenome. That's a great idea. Note to self, call Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> no, AIM-3 th AIM is, is an observational clinical trial. <laughs> yes? So is anything known about the mechanism, how this fatty acids inhibits growth? Yeah. Uh, so there is some data about how free fatty acids inhibit streptococcal growth. Um, and basically, the short answer is they make the membrane more permeable. So through membrane permeabilization um, and then the cells die. So, but this would require a substantial amount of this fatty acid. Is it reasonable that that much of this fatty acid is produced? We think so. Okay. Th and I will say, like, this is a very interesting story for us, for Karani, particularly even thinking about pediatric populations. Um, adults have a, on their skin have a high rate of, a high density of, uh, high density for skin, of propionibacterium acnes, particularly in oily sites. And it also contains a lipase and years ago was um, pinned down as maybe the major microbial producer of lipase at a number of skin adult sites. Um, and in addition, also, actually, we as hosts can secrete some lipases. So, so I remember Larry Shimkitz at UGA. He studied myxobacteria. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and he could show that certain fatty acids surface signaling molecules to trigger a certain response of the population. So maybe it's not inhibition, but it's a signaling molecule that triggers a response. A response of in the strep or in the crani? In the strep. The data that exists looks pretty decent for direct inhibition at, at high enough levels. I'd have to go back. I don't remember if our concentrations are on the skin are known to be comparable enough. Um, it is possible that these free fatty acids actually serve as a, there's one paper suggesting they may actually influence host gene expression. So they may be part of a give and take back and forth between commensal bacteria and the host is one possibility, but there's very little literature at present to support that. Yes. Oh, oh sorry. Anyway, um, 
So you alluded to the fact that um, low biomass is an issue, and also you described um, the issue in, well, in your lab that you're mainly looking at isolates and doing transcriptomics on isolates. Yeah. I'm just wondering if progress has been made uh, in the skin microbiome project towards trying to work with um, entire communities like doing metatranscriptomics or metagenomics um, in skin samples. So metagenomics, due to the yes. Okay. Uh, there's okay. very nice work from Heidi Kong and Julie Segre at NIH um, with a nice survey of different skin sites with metagenomics. Um, metatranscriptomics, not yet. We've started, one of our efforts is to do the QRT-PCR now that we have genes to really focus on. This has worked really well for one group in Germany and we haven't been able to replicate it. Um, you would think it would actually be an easier process because there should be, if it's transcribed, there should be multiple copies, right? Um, so this for us is still a technical hurdle that very few people have gotten over. So I think we will see metatranscriptomic uh, analysis of the nasal um, community. I hope that we are one of the groups doing that, but we aren't there yet technically.